Thank you. Okay, I am pleased to welcome Reid Hoffman, uh, one of the early executives at PayPal and founder of LinkedIn, and to date me some, a Dungeon and Dragons aficionado. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Reid. Matter of fact, my first publication was a uh, RuneQuest, which is a D&D supplement uh, scenario pack. That was when I was 12. <laughs> So since then, you've moved on to be an author, among many other hats. Uh, you wrote a book uh, called Blitzscaling, which I've been um, lucky enough to read, listen to. I'm swimming around in it. So <laughs> excited to t chat with you about that. For anyone in the audience that is not familiar with Blitzscaling, let's start with what is it? So the precise definition of blitzscaling is prioritizing speed over efficiency in an environment of uncertainty. Part of why it's not just get big fast, do whatever, is because it's a set of techniques and a set of evaluations in that. And when, you're when you are prioritizing speed over efficiency, it's actually expensive. It's expensive in capital, it's expensive in organizational dynamics, it's expensive in uh, recruiting and uh, kind of human capital uh, factors. And the reason you do it is because you're in a Glengarry Glen Ross market where first prize is an El Dorado, second prize is steak knives, third prize is you're fired, right? And so first to scale really, really matters, so it's okay to be super inefficient at getting to be first to scale. Now part of uncertainty is, and this is the difference that we put in the book between fast scaling and blitz scaling is, you may not know some key questions. You may not know actually in fact what your scale customer acquisition cost is, your unit economics. You may still be putting the puzzle pieces of what your business model is together and a set of those things, but yet the first to scale is in fact what really matters in this. And that's a set of techniques that uh, essentially through the, the learning network of Silicon Valley, because one of the things that makes Silicon Valley, I think, continue to be a very interesting place in the world is that we share learnings. And that was part of the thing that came out and that was part of the reason why I wrote the book. Okay. Let's talk about when to do this and when not to. Because So let's start with one of the precedent conditions you mentioned is having product market fit. Mm -hmm. And as we were discussing, this is a, a more nuanced question than a binary have or have not. So what does it mean to have product market fit? So the first question, you would think because I'm an author of a book called Blitzscaling, that it's like everyone should blitzscale, that's your goal. It's not the goal, it's super expensive. Um, it can actually uh, put you way out over your skis and you could blow up inefficiently. Uh, basically, uh, two primary reasons to blitz scale. One of them is competition. You have competition that's coming after you because if your competitor can and will blitz scale, that means that if you're not, you'll probably fail. You'll either have to pivot away or, or actually also get in the mix. Um, second is, do you need to get to scale? Do you have a coefficient where you need to get to scale? Uh, scale effects in the business. Uh, and generally, of course, uh, sometimes you can do it anyway and don't have network effects or some other reason in your business to do it, but it can be super expensive as a, as a way of doing it. Now, uh, generally speaking, one of the things that David and I were just talking about uh, in the green room is we have this kind of mantra of product market fit within the Valley, which is thought to be kind of like a digital thing. It's either you have it or you don't have it. And which of course is really wrong once you start looking at it because the question is, well, you, 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 know, you got a good product market fit with your first 10,000 customers, but what really matters is scale product market fit with whatever the scale of what your addressable market, what you're going to uh, with your business is. It can also say that, oh, I've got good product market fit. Like I'll take a, 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 an early Early example, this also dates us, is uh, Mark Pincus's company, Tribe, had good product market fit with the Burning Man crowd, <laughs> right? And so it really worked well for them, and that's one of the reasons why probably many of you never heard of Tribe, didn't realize it was a social network, started six months after Friendster, started before Facebook, and actually didn't go anywhere because its product market fit wasn't the product market fit that would actually take it into being an interesting business. So you have to ask the more detailed questions, and you have to make sure that you're steering towards it. And to uh, part, you may go deeper in this question, but like for example, part of the reason one of the counterintuitive rules that I put in blitzscaling the book was ignore your customer is what you're doing is ignoring your current customer in favor of your target customer. And in particular with scale, your scale target customer. Because that's the thing that you ultimately have to get right. Now, if sometimes if you don't get elements of this right, you can't get there. 
But that's the product market fit you're looking for, which is what is the scale, mature, you know, kind of uh, your business as a successful business, and how do you get there? So what would be a, a, the kind of marginal cases of maybe one example where it seemed like a company had product market fit and stepped on the gas and it didn't, and mm -hmm. one where it should have or, or did, but it was subtle to tell that it had product market fit and should blitz scale? So, um, well, instances of, of probably of had it and failed is probably Friendster, um, which didn't uh, get out of its own organizational way to rebuild its infrastructure, deliver as a comms platform, and do some other things, because they had the first, oh my god, the internet's not boring anymore, 2002, 2003, and that was part of what uh, people started realizing back then was that there was not much interesting going on on the internet, and people were looking for new things, because the internet continued to grow. Uh, and so that's one that probably should have and didn't um, in terms of like scaling up its organization, doing a whole bunch of stuff on that. Um, it may have still failed as a business, but it certainly failed in the in the path it was on. And then, um, you know, maybe a kind of a canonical one that applied the gas incorrectly is Webvan, because uh, this is one of the places where, like, when you're uh, when you're applying blitzscaling, uh, it's one of the reasons that's generally much easier in software and consumer internet, but also SaaS, but in software, than it is in hardware problems, because if you get something wrong, it's dead in hardware, whereas you can iterate. And so, for example, the capital intensity uh, to make the economic model work within the web van business was catastrophic, and basically the moment that free capital started flowing, it fell over. Um, you know, the, that, that capital stopped flowing and then it fell over. The, um, uh, and that's part of the reason why a lot of the blitz scaling stuff tends to be, you know, because you can figure out your business model as you're going if you're working on a lightweight business like software. So how should Adam's companies or companies involved in, some, in the physical world think about blitz scaling? So um, the key thing in all of this is to understand that speed is relative to your competition at going at your market. So it isn't go as fast as Facebook did or as Google did, et cetera. It's, it's what's the speed for, re for realization? And there's a Masters of Scale episode by which we go into OODA loop, which is one of the things that you know, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, which is fighter pilot stuff. So, so it's not, oh my god, Adam's company need to move as fast. So it's a, it's a relative measure to what you're doing. The second question is, is what's your cost of error? So if your cost of error is very high, you actually want to spend a lot of time uh, getting that right, because if you, for example, start building up uh, substantial inventory, um, you get your hardware design wrong and you just fail, those kinds of things, you go, okay, that's, that's, that's part of the first product market fit before you get there. Now, it isn't to say the case that you can't make it work. I mean, probably the canonical roller coaster uh, comes out of China, which is Xiaomi, which says, okay, we're going to uh, essentially give away the hardware at, at zero cost Baum uh, with the idea of creating a software platform. The software platform still TBD from what I can tell in terms of really playing out because that's, you know, the question is Tencent and others tend to be more owning the, the, the mobile um, content platform there. But they actually, in fact, ended up getting a fairly good um, business on the accessories. So the, can I, your design of business model is really key to blitz scaling. And, and while they had failures with some of the other things, they actually now come back to uh, how, do we, how are we building out the mobile phone ecosystem and making that also not just relevant to China, but various other part emerging markets. What are some things that we could learn from what's worked in China? Because it certainly has sunk into me there's real blitz scaling happening. So one I just mentioned, which is Xiaomi, which is an example of, of, of hardware uh, blitz scaling. Actually, I'll give three parts to the answer. That's one. Two is um, one of the really key things in blitz scaling is do you have 
uh, at least an interesting shot on goal for catching the right business model and making it work. And so there is various business models that are being iterated in China that we copied today. So a lot of the digital goods business models that we see various companies doing here, those were basically looking at China and saying, okay, which versions work outside of China and how do you do that? So. Um, and that's, again, software, mostly consumer internet, uh, mostly games uh, kind of business. The third thing is to think about um, what are the ways relative to your competitors. And I'll, 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 I'll highlight one that we highlight in the book, which is Zara, which is fast fashion. And the manufacturing's in Spain, right? So this is not a, oh, how do you go get the cheapest possible area? And they said, look, it is still a technology story because the question is, well, can we actually, in fact, train our sales associates to accurately capture signal about what people are looking for, get that signal back to a design shop, which can then create something fast, and then using manufacturing in Spain at high quality, it's fashion, plus automation, that whole loop can be literally three weeks to having new fashion in the, sh in the storefront. And that doesn't mean that it's all automated factories and anything else, but you're, you're looking at intel gathering, des design facilitation, and manufacturing to have that as a fast loop. And that's a, it's not a hardware business, but it's a physical good that's an Adams business that uses technology and uses software to accelerate that loop. That's, a, that's an example of something that has really worked. Okay, let's talk about the uh, how much to push the edge with blitzscaling. So let, let me give you two areas so you can talk about either or both. I, you already mentioned that one thing to do in blitzscaling is to ignore your customers. Yes. And I wanted you to comment on that, noting that some successful entrepreneurs that this audience has heard from, like Jeff Bezos, talk about the importance of obsessing about customer delight. So let's talk about, and you did mention that you're looking at the long-term customer, but that, and then the other one that I'd maybe weave into that is you talk about how it's important to tolerate bad management, but then in the book, you also, I would say, condemn, or at least uh, uh, point out the shortcomings of a culture like Uber's. Yep. So how do we give the good without the bad or without too much of the bad? Um, so I'll do the first and the second. So um, we say tolerate bad management, not tolerate criminal management. And so you have a, you have a culture that uh, encourages or allows sexual harassment. You have, uh, or you know, kind of uh, highly deceptive practices on things that matter to people. Like for example, you know, uh, we were talking a little bit about the Theranos, but blood tests don't mislead people, at least your customers, <laughs> right, about what it is, because that may lead to a catastrophic outcomes if they, if they believe you. And so uh, those are kinds of things where you go too wrong. What tolerate bad management means is as you're moving along very fast, you might say, well, we're not gonna have one-on-ones about where your career is. We're uh, not going to be kind of checking in about how happy you are in the current thing because we're gonna presume that you have a certain amount of resilience in this chaos that is a blitzscaling company. And so I think that the, the question around tolerating bad management is not saying tolerate um, kind of bad cultures or something else, but it is saying the kinds of things that you would think about that would be taught at kind of performance management at a MBA school, you may get to later. And you want to have the basis that you can get to them later, but that's part of the reason why you have to have your culture solid, right? But, uh, but you may not be doing while you're in the middle of it because um, of how to make things go. Now, part of the ignore your customer uh, question is, so in very early days of PayPal, we were growing at two to 5% uh, per day compounding. And uh, as such, uh, because we, didn't, we had a product that was nice and easy to use, and it also put payments in a bunch of different cases. People didn't get their good, people didn't get their money, people spent the money but didn't get the good yet, et cetera, and all these kinds of things. We had an exponentiating curve of customer inquiries, complaints, everything else, and we had two customer service people and an office manager who pinch hit. So what they discovered was they, they, they figured out what our mainline phone number was, which was not listed anywhere other than Palo Alto local business directory, dialed extensions at random such that seven, hour, seven days, 24 hours a week, 
every extension was ringing with an angry customer. So we, of course, turned off all the phones, started using our cell phones as a way of doing it. Now, kind of a classic basic thing was, oh, go make sure you delight those customers. It's a lost cause, not gonna work, <laughs> right? And so what really mattered was not these 10,000 people who are gonna be pretty angry with us for a while. We're really meant to, as we, as we get to the millions and millions of customers, how do we work for them? So we just kind of steamed past them, got to setting up customer service center, got to getting it fixed. So the question about not just you know, being good to your customers, but surprising and delighting them is super important in the long run. It is the right pole star. But the question that you, that you then back up and analyze is, for getting to that pole star, where do I have to be now? What is the things I invest in? What are the things that I do? Because of course we would love to have each moment be a surprise and delight. But one of the problems that entrepreneurs frequently find when they do that is they go, well, I'm trying to get there, and then I take too long in releasing the product, because very few of us are the geniuses of, I know exactly what the customers will want. I need to be learning from them. I need to have a learning loop, the engagement and so forth. And I need to be moving fast enough that I'm getting that learning and then I'm in the first to scale. So there's a wide variety of products that were not in the initial surprise and delight category that ended up being you know, substantive products. You know, in the social network arena, I think LinkedIn's one of those. I think the first couple million people on LinkedIn were like, what the fuck is this? And why, why would I bother using this? <laughs> right? Now it's more essential as part of it. And enough people would experiment with it that we could get there. But that's a, as an example of where there wasn't love initially, or even better relative to the product market fit question that you asked earlier. The people who first loved us were these people called LinkedIn Open Networkers, which was like, you know, people like, you know, Bill Gates and Vinod Kosla should respond to my emails when I'm asking them questions and so forth, which is like, we're really busy. We can't respond to emails from all kinds of people. And so that's what they wanted. Those are the initial adopters. Well, we ignore those adopters for the scale, like you know, who are uh, regular professionals, who are hiring managers, who are business development people, who are entrepreneurs. You know, who are, and then as it gets to targeting everybody, and that's the kind of thing that you have to think about, about when does the surprise and delight hit, and that should always be your pole star, but that doesn't necessarily mean right now. So in a similar vein, you talk about being willing to ignore fires hmm. and just put out the right fires. So more specifically, what kinds of things do you see entrepreneurs spending too much time trying to solve? What kind of problems do people overfocus on solving that they should be more tolerant to just ignore and focus on different problems? Probably there's there's probably at least two kinds of problems that people overly focus on. So one is, um, sometimes you're looking at two or three problems that could kill your business. And sometimes it's really difficult, but you need, need to focus on the one that will kill your business soonest. And you go, okay, I know those ones could kill me later, but I can kind of kick the can down the road, I can patch them a little bit, I can figure it out later. So. Um, you know, so for example, the PayPal example is one of those, which is, well, uh, an exponentiating complaint line from your customer service thing will eventually kill you, right? But we can go get ahead of that problem later, right? Like we can build toward now, but we can, we can dig ourselves out of the hole of a whole bunch of threads on the internet, PayPal's a scam, you know, uh, they take your money, they, you know, they don't, like, it doesn't, it doesn't actually really work, et cetera, et cetera, and we can dig our way out of that later. The thing that we really need to get to right now is uh, the first scale mover advantage on eBay because they owned a competitor to us, Bill Point, which if we didn't get ahead, we're dead anyway. So it's kind of which, 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 which stack ordering of these will kill you and getting that right. The second one tends to be who are the people who are loudest and most complaining to you, whether it's internal employees or certain kinds of customer groups where that customer, that's not your scale customer. And because they're there and talking to you, you're listening to them. So you have to be really careful about who do I need to listen to? And frequently, your scale customer or the customer that you're really targeting is actually not the person who's actually in the room talking, and that's what you need to be listening to. And that isn't saying trust your own inner genius. That's making sure that you're listening to what the right source of this is where we're trying to get to. Okay, uh, a related question about when to do what is when to be 
stubbornly persistent mm. and when to be flexibly enlightened about changing strategy. How do you know the difference? So this is uh, your, thank you, David, for borrowing the, your, you, for using my, my language in the question. Uh, persistence and flexibility, a, par a paradox of advice given entrepreneurs. Have, uh, be, have grit, stay on target, plow through walls, be flexible, pivot, change, learn from what's going on. <laughs> right? And uh, the way that I do this, the specific way that I recommend uh, entrepreneurs look at this is to say, have an investment thesis that's kind of, and write it down, an explicit set of things that are, here is what our plan is, this is why we believe in it, this is the set of things that need to be true for this plan to work. Then, as you're encountering difficulties, almost all, like 99.99% of, of entrepreneurial projects have value of the shadow moments. Like, oh my God, why did I think this was gonna work? LinkedIn certainly had those. And so, um, and so as you're doing it, you're saying, okay, well, I, t I tried idea one, I tried idea two, I tried idea three. If uh, your, uh, the ideas aren't working, and your, your view that the ideas are getting worse, right? Like, like idea four is not as good as idea two. That's when to think about pivoting. That's when to trigger in flexibility. That's when to say, okay, um, this isn't a question of just grit and persistence. This is a question of, of I need to change. And by the way, one of the things that people think about ideal failure, they think I must test it to its gory end in the market. That you don't need to be doing. You want to be looking for as many early signals as possible. And so for early stage entrepreneurs, my general recommendation is to go to all the smart people you know and say, what's wrong with this? Why won't it work? If you hear from a number of smart people, this is the thing, then you'd better have a theory about why they're wrong. You better have something you're testing about why they're wrong. You can actually test your theory, this investment thesis, without actually, in fact, going and getting, like, well, we did this huge launch and we got all this customer data. You can do that beforehand and you want to be testing it. And part of the whole thing about failing fast is try to get to what pieces of failure or what pieces of negative data will cause you to change your plan as soon as possible. That's super important to get to. One last question about blitz scaling. One of the attributes of blitz scaling is being willing to spend money inefficiently. Yep. How would you compare spending money on blitz scaling, which I think of as stepping on the gas on something you're doing, yep. versus spending money on experiments that might enhance your business in a different way, like Square Cash to Square's main mm -hmm. business, like that? How would you trade off that spending? So, um, I think it's almost always important to have some experiments um, unless you really just have no capital for them. I mean, sometimes you go, look, we just, like, like just to get this to work, we don't have, or, and that's when, like, we're tightening the belts, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, using, you know, kind of door frames as our, as our desks, you know, like, okay, you don't have, you don't, you, your company is the experiment, you don't have room for other experiments. And so, um, once you begin to get to a point where you have a multi-threaded organization, some experimentation uh, is good. And sometimes experimentation can be super light. Experimentation could be, I put up a web page and I take out some, a light amount of Facebook advertising on it just to see if people will click through and sign up for some product or feature. Even I don't have the product or feature or anything else and I could even do it under a different brand just to test, is there something interesting here? Should we, this might be something we could do, should we, should we do it? And a lot of early stage entrepreneurs do that to test do I have an initial idea that I should go fund a company around? So that kind of thing is, I think, important. And obviously, as experiments get more costly and more uh, tricky, you should be much more choiceful about how you do them. Now, on the blitzscaling capital, in the, in, the, in the deploying of capital to get very large, once you're really blitzscaling, you have a fairly large chaotic organization that people, groups are duplicating effort, running into each other, et cetera. So you might as well take advantage of that to make sure that you're allowing some experimentation as well, because you're gonna have that anyway, right? The thing that you have to be careful about is, is to make sure that people know that their experiments don't mean that the organization hates me or hates my project if that doesn't get caught up into the three to seven things maximum that an organization can really do at scale. Usually, sometimes it's only one, but like, 
kind of the, it's, you know, um, it's three to seven things that, that a company can have in its executive team's mind space, really. And sometimes all that experimentation, people go, oh, I was doing this really important thing and I got, I, I was ignored. So you need to make sure your culture allows for that. Look, not all experiments, uh, even if they have good results, will necessarily be adopted, and that's fine. Okay, one last question, not about blitzscaling, but something that affects most founders. Mm -hmm. It, last year we had Jeff Weiner here, mm. and it'd be interesting to get your take on, it's a broader question than how as a founder do you work with a non-founder senior executive. More as a founder, how should you think about your own role evolving? Like how do you know if it's hard, but no one can do this job better than you and you should just hire a stronger team versus mm. nope, it's time to be chairman and we'll need a different CEO. So I think you need to have two things as a founder. So one is, uh, a real good recognition of what your own strengths and desires are, because you're not world class at anything that you're not passionate about. And you're always passionate about your company, but like, are you passionate about, like, for example, scaling a company? Are you passionate about all of the work that goes into, we're building an entire organization around onboarding groups of people, about scale management, about all of that kind of thing. And if you're not passionate about that, you need to have someone who's passionate about it. It could be a COO, it could be a CEO. For me, part of the thing that I realized was that I wanted to get a, and by the way, you can hire, when you hire a later stage uh, CEO, like I did with Jeff, it isn't just, oh, go find someone with the experience, someone who's, you know, run scale organizations. You want to find someone who has the same passions as a co-founder, and that would be kind of a, a, a condition on it. And like Jeff cares about compassion management, cares about scaling organizations, cares about career development, cares about education, cares about a bunch of things that LinkedIn's pretty central to. So he would like go, look, I will bleed and take risks for the long-term health of this business the same as I would because this is what he actually wants his mission and his life to be. Now with that, I went, okay, well, so someone who is world class at building scale organizations, it's much better to have that person come in and be CEO and to have me be chairman, and that's how LinkedIn succeeds in its mission. And so it's different for different companies and different for different people, but that's the kind of thing. And I did write an essay about this on, that's all, both on LinkedIn and I think reedhoffman.org blog about how to think about hiring a CEO and what to do. Thank you. Okay, we'll squeeze in one question. if. Go ahead. Yep. Yes, and we can repeat it. Um, just looking back Reed, on your uh, the origins of, of LinkedIn. Oh, you have a mic and time. Uh, looking back on the on the origins of LinkedIn and the journey from the founding of it, are there, is there anything that you wish you'd done differently or um, sequenced hmm. differently in the early stages? Well, the one thing I would say, there's lots, because um, by the way, if you can't answer this question about like what you would do differently, you're not learning, and I hope to, I aspire to be a learner. And so the key thing was, um, I would say that we probably over-rotated on some competitive things. So like, for example, we launched LinkedIn groups way too early. Now, just knowing that it wasn't gonna work, that ex ante doesn't help you. What you learn is to say, what are the principles that you would then apply? And the principle I apply is, I would only launch a new product line in competitive response if we would actually pivot the entire company to making it work, right? So like that, that there was a theory that some other companies had that the way that we could beat LinkedIn is we could build groups products and said, okay, we built a lightweight groups product. And actually, in fact, what we should have done is either not done that and just stuck to our knitting on the theory because we stuck around for years with a lame ass product. It took time cycles, it, it legitimately customers said, what, what's with this weak ass product, <laughs> right, et cetera. Or say, no, it becomes a first class product and is now centrally to what we're doing. And so the principle is, don't engage in a competitive response without being, like either engage in it and be full hearted, or don't engage in it. And for example, while there were many things that Uber got right, launching UberX in response to Lyft was what, like, but they did it wholeheartedly. They went, full into it, that was the right kind of thing to do. Okay, we'll do one other question if anyone else has any burning desire for one. Okay, back there. Hi. Um, I was um, sort of trying to understand when do you blitz scale? Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess the way I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it is that you must have a lot of conviction that the market's really big. Yep. Right? 
And so what are the necessary conditions for the market and that no one else knows about it, right? Like well, those, I guess, are those the two conditions? No, so the key question is, look, if no one else knows about it, you shouldn't prioritize speed over efficiency unless you think competitors are just about to come. It's very costly to do this. What you want to do is you want to say, okay, if I think competition is either present or about to come and blitzscaling is the right way to work, then I should be the first to do it and I should go do it. But like, look at like, look at the billions of dollars that Uber has spent. These things are hu hugely expensive. So you want to do it when you go. I need to beat the competition. If you're doing a contrarian bet, where most people think your product is like uh, unclear if there's a market there, unclear if there's a scale market, you should try to f uh, to to essential unless you know uh, unless you think a competition's a competition's about to merge, you should tune it to get it as right as possible, and then you know do a classic efficiency of tuning your customer acquisition, tuning your business model, tuning your product market fit, and being very choiceful. Doesn't necessarily mean impoverished, but very choiceful with your capital. Thank you, Reed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.